Today we gather as family of friends of Bernice, a woman who touched many of us in many different ways. My experience with her, a, a strong woman of faith, um, quiet, but when she started talking, uh, sometimes she had a lot to say that just came pouring out, and it was a, it was a joy to get to know her. So my heart goes out to you, Bill, and, and the entire family, and the suddenness of, of her departure from us all. So we gather to <clears throat> remember her today. We also gather uh, as friends to support her family, to be here, to encourage them, to, to give them a shoulder to lean on, and to share our love with them. I'm sure all of you will do a great job of doing that. But we also gather today because we're people of God, and to hear <clears throat> the promise that comes not only to her, but to all of us through Jesus Christ. So we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that and reflecting upon that and discovering uh, maybe perhaps for some of you the first time what that means, what that promise is all about. Because it is really all that we have at this time. Would you join me as we reflect upon uh, some scripture passages that St. Paul wrote? <clears throat> the first is from his second letter to Corinthians, the first or the first chapter. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all of our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. And in Romans 6, St. Paul writes, When we were baptized, we died. And we were buried with Christ. We were baptized so that we would live a new life as Christ was raised to life by the glory of the Father. And if we share in Jesus' death by being baptized, we will be raised to life with Him. Those are words to trust at these times. Let us join in prayer. God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Bernice. We thank you for giving her to us to love and to know us as we live our lives on earth. And in your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so we may see in death the gate to eternal life, that we may live our lives with a confidence and a hope in your promise. Until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let us join together in singing, Breathe on me, breath of God. The words will be on the screen.
share with you a couple scripture passages that I'm going to be spending some time this morning reflecting upon. They're both very familiar, the first one perhaps even more familiar than the second. The first is from King David, known as the 23rd Psalm. And King David writes this, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. From the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the first verse, Jesus says these words to his disciples and to us, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here ends the reading. Let's join together in singing, I Heard the Voice of Jesus.
that you would place upon my lips what you desire to be revealed, and that you'd open all of our hearts to the power and truth contained in your teaching, that through this we would be transformed into the people that you desire us to be. Pray this in the holy and precious name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. The uh, hymn we just sang, you remember the last phrase? Till my traveling days are done. And we look and we see Bernice's casket. We don't hear her voice anymore or her smile. And in many ways, her traveling days are done. But I want to have us turn our attention to Psalm 23. Because Psalm 23 is a travel psalm. It's a journey psalm. It's a, a psalm where King David is reflecting, I think, upon life and the journey that all of us take in life. I, I, have, I have found absolutely no commentary, no explanation uh, for what I'm about to say, so I'm going to say it anyway. So this is purely a titlerism. I think that King David was writing this psalm reflecting on life. That he, that he reached a point in his life asking, what's this all about? What, what is the purpose of life? What is this thing that we do as we journey through all the years and the weeks and the months? And have you ever asked that question? Yeah, we do. And I think what happened to King David is suddenly the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, took him back to his childhood outside Bethlehem, where as a scrawny little kid, he used to take care of his dad's sheep, remembering all the things that he had to do for his dad's sheep to, to make sure that they were watered and fed and protected. And it hit him. You know what? As I go through this journey of life, I got a shepherd. And the Lord is my shepherd. Doing a lot of the thing, same things that, that I used to do for my dad's sheep. Bringing me to, to good watering holes. Supplying me with all the daily needs that I have in life. And that the journey that I'm on is really the path that he has laid out for me. King David makes a, a very interesting comment here. He, he talks about the Lord restoring our soul. And then he goes on and he says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now I want to pause on that for a second. Because a lot of times when we hear that phrase, uh, a path of righteousness, uh, our minds instantly go to kind of moral living. And I think there's a part of that, an, an element of that. But this path that, that David is talking about is a path that leads someplace. Now, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran, and so Lutherans get real gnarly on this stuff, so I'm just gonna, gonna paint a Lutheran perspective, because Bernice is a Lutheran too. A fairly traditional one, by the way. And when we talk about righteousness in the Lutheran circles, we talk about something very unique, very different, something world perhaps doesn't even understand. And the world misunderstands Christianity in this whole righteousness thing. Virtually every other faith, every other religion on the face of the earth understands righteousness as being moral behavior, as doing uh, religious rites and rituals to make yourself kind of holy in the eyes of God. Christianity is extraordinarily different. We talk about a righteousness that does not come by works, does not come by anything that we do. It is a righteousness that comes only by faith and trust in the shepherd and where he's leading us and where we're going. Paul calls this a righteousness by faith, a righteousness by trust. So we, on this righteous path, are only righteous because of what Jesus Christ has done. We are only 
made righteous, right with God. We are only justified because of what Jesus Christ has done. What God, out of love for us, all of us sinners, has redeemed us. Has redeemed us, taken something without value and given it great worth. And Jesus did that on the cross. He did that on the cross. We walk on this path of righteousness. Listen to this, for His name's sake. Not for ours. Not so that people think we're all that. Not so that people praise us. We do it for His name's sake. Bill said, I don't want you to puff a furnace up. I want you to talk about Jesus. How am I doing so far? All right, good. I'll keep going then if I got the thumbs up for Bill. Look what happens next. David says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This is something chilling that we need to pay attention to. God has, has revealed to David that in death there is something that should cause us pause. And that is evil. And the Hebrew word used for evil here is the word raw, meaning, meaning evil in all of its ferocity and power. It's not just moral badness, it's not something that's icky or uncomfortable. It is something seeking to devour us and to destroy us. Using this, this image of, of the sheep, it's like the wolf lurking in the shadows for that straggling sheep to rip it away from the flock to take it away from the master. And David says that evil lurks in the darkness of death. But then he says what? I'm not going to fear that evil. Now, now somebody might go, well, yeah, he was a, a wealthy king. Uh, he was a powerful leader. He could bark out commands and, and people would do whatever he wanted to do. He was a great military leader. We hear in scripture that tens of thousands of his, his soldiers were willing to lay down their lives for him. And he says, I will not fear that evil because David is all that, right? No. When death comes out, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much you're able to bark out commands and have people to do stuff. It doesn't matter how big your army is. Death doesn't care about any of that stuff. David says, I will not fear that death because why? You are with me. You are with me. That's, that same shepherd that walks with us every step of our daily lives, that supplies us all the things that we need, that shepherd will not abandon us during death. He says, your rod and your staff, they come from me. The rod and the staff, they gently guided the sheep. They were also the weapons of, of death. They were the weapons that killed the wild beast if the wild beast came to try to get the flock. Your weapons of death, O oh Lord, they comfort me. That is a strange phrase. Unless you're a Christian. We adorn our sanctuaries with crosses. Put them on top of our buildings. We wear them as rings on our fingers around our neck. Do you know what this is? This is a brutal, horrible, awful form of execution. It was used by the, the Romans to send a message, you don't mess with us, or you're going to die like this horrible, agonizing death that will last not just hours, it'll last days. You will wish you were dead over and over again. And what do we do? We put it in our sanctuaries. Why? Because it comforts us. It comforts us. Because we are reminded what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. That he took on our sins upon himself. And he gave us his righteousness. Our new righteousness, and we're able to live in life, it's His righteousness, it's not ours. And He takes our sins upon Himself. And Paul says, you know what the wages of sin, you know what the, the payment for sin is? It's death. But he's talking about separation from God. Jesus has redeemed us. I 
morning with you guys. We, we are kindred spirits this week because my father in passed away on Saturday. So I, I know your pain. I feel it. I'm getting a little perplexed right now using a good Jewish word. And on Sunday morning, my wife and I were watching our, our worship service and one of our uh, youth guys who's gone to seminary, and he, he's, a, he's a great pastor, he just doesn't have the official title, the name of Chris Anderson, he was, he was preaching on Daniel and the lion's den. And he paused in the middle of that sermon and he, and he asked a question, he said, he said what, what lion den are you living in right now? And I, I turned to my wife and I said, den, how about dens, right? Feels like so many lion dens were in. And, and then he kept preaching, and then my mind just goes in the spirit. It's horrible being a pastor listening to somebody else preach because your mind starts creating and crafting a sermon while they're preaching. And so my mind started going, and, and all of a sudden I had this image that, that Daniel couldn't get out of the lion's den. I mean, they, they rolled a big stone over that. Oh, he couldn't get out. And I thought, there are so many things in life that we want to call lion's dens. But all it takes is some figuring out we can get out of it. And I turned to my wife and I said, your dad's death. That's a real lion's den. Because you can't get out of that one. You can't, you can't escape that one. And then Chris kept preaching. And all of a sudden, it hit me, Daniel does get out of the lion's den. But do you know what happens? Ready? They roll the stone away. And Daniel comes out. Protected in the darkness. And I thought, Glenn's not trapped. Ernest isn't trapped. You know why? The stone was rolled away. Not Daniel's stone. Jesus' stone. It was rolled away from his tomb. And he stepped forth to let every single one of us know death does not have the final word. Evil is destroyed in the darkness of death. Have you ever noticed Psalm 23 doesn't stop in the valley of the shadow of death? It's only half done. The journey continues right through the valley of the shadow of death and you're still with the shepherd and he's on a destination. That journey continues on, and he takes you where? To the house of the Lord, where you live forever. There, you'll spend time at a table with your enemies. Restoration, reconciliation, huh? You, you'll have your, your head anointed with oil, where you will remember God has chosen you. He has anointed you. He has selected you to be one of his sheep. Blessing can't contain everything the Lord has given you, and it overflows. Most translations say goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I, I don't like those translations in Hebrew. You really know what it says? Bill knows I do this all the time. I keep going back to the old language. And it says, it will pursue you. It will hunt you down. It's like that, the, the good shepherd that leaves the 99 sheep behind and goes to find that one lost sheep, hunting them down out of goodness and love to do what? To bring them home. To bring them home. Where you dwell in the house of the Lord. You know how to get there? Everybody wants to say, well, yeah, you're a good person. No, 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 no. It's a wrong thing. Remember, you got Jesus' righteousness. Remember, it's Jesus that saves you on the cross. Remember, it's He whose stone is rolled away that, that you have life that is promised to you for all of eternity. Jesus told His disciples, He said, I'm going to the Father's house to prepare a place for you for all of eternity. If I go and prepare a place, I'm going to come and I'm going to take you to be with me. I'm going to walk through that valley of the shadow of death with you to take you home. And he says, you know where I'm going. Now, poor Thomas gets a bad rap, right? 
I mean, can you imagine for eternity everybody calls you doubting Thomas? He just asked the question all of us are wondering. He's at least honest. Maybe we should call him Honest Thomas. He says, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get there. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know, I don't know what, what road I'm supposed to start walking down, Lord. I don't know. You remember Jesus' words? It's not about you walking down the path. It's not about me giving you a map or GPS coordinates. It's about me. I am the way. He's the road. Jesus is the path. He says, I am the truth, not a truth among many. I am the truth. And I am the life. Anyone who gets to the Father comes through me. That's faith. That's trust. And a lot of us go, it can't be that simple. But it is. Earnestly that. My father in law me. My father in law, I can't remember how old he was, 85, 86, something like that. When he was 48 years old, he had double bypass surgery. And we didn't know if he was going to make it. And as they were ready to wheel him in for surgery, all of us are blubbering like idiots because we feel totally out of control. You know how I knew my father-in-law knew that Jesus was the answer? This is what he said to us. Okay, we're supposed to minister to him, right? Family, you hear this? He's ministering to us. And this is what he said. He said, look guys, if I die on the operating table, I'm with Jesus. And if I survive the operating table, I'm with you. Either way, I'm a winner. Ernest is a winner. We all feel like losers right now. We miss her. We grieve. I mean, that's honest. Christians grieve just like anybody else. Our hearts are broken. But here's the difference. We grieve as people with hope. And that hope is rooted in the shepherd. In Jesus. In what he has done. That his stone rolled away. And all of us who believe and trust in him. We're set free. In the precious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to life. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Now into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend Bernice. Receive her into the arms of your everlasting mercy and peace. Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Mine own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to review you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father. Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will
will be 